title of our sermon this morning is A Fool for Christ. A Fool for Christ. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 22 to 33. When we first met the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, known as Saul of Tarsus in those days, Paul is a young man in Acts chapter 7, consenting to the death of the first Christian martyr, who is Stephen. As great persecution is then breaking out against followers of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem, Paul, the Saul of Tarsus, is making havoc of the church in Acts chapter 8, entering every house, dragging off Christians, committing them to prison. By his own testimony, Paul is proud, Paul is boastful, Paul is arrogant, Paul is insolent. By his own testimony, Paul had every reason to boast as others boast according to the flesh. Boasting in his own heritage, boasting in his own accomplishments, boasting in his own work, in his own labor for his cause. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul says that he had every reason to have confidence in the flesh. He was, of course, circumcised the eighth day. He was of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the law, he was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, he persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, he once considered himself to be blameless. He would have boasted, much like these false teachers who have wormed their way into the church at Corinth. He would have boasted like they are boasting. Boasting in their heritage. Boasting in their credentials. Boasting in their accomplishments. Boasting in their work. Boasting in their labor. Boasting in their visions. Boasting in their ecstatic utterances. Boasting in the work of the Lord through them. Boasting, all of it, according to the flesh. But something dramatic, something profound, happened to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. Paul has a life-changing encounter with the risen Lord. He meets the risen Lord Jesus Christ on the road. An event in Paul's life of seismic proportions. Shaking Paul to his core. In Paul's worldview, Paul's understanding would be forever changed. Now, as we fast forward nearly two decades to Corinth, two decades, what do we find Paul doing? Paul is tirelessly and faithfully serving the Lord's church even to his own harm. The chief of sinners, having once persecuted the church, now bearing in his body daily... The dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. The contrast in the life of Paul himself is stunning. Those two pictures painted for us on the pages of the New Testament. It's stunning. A stunning contrast. Once a picture of worldly strength. Once a picture of worldly confidence. Of worldly wisdom. Of worldly power. Wielded for worldly gain or worldly glory. Now, after his conversion and by his own admission in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul has come to the church at Corinth in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Not with excellence of speech, not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but scorned, derided, attacked, assaulted, dishonored as a man condemned to death. Paul would say, made a spectacle, made the filth of the world, the off-scouring of all things until now, a fool for Christ's sake, preaching a message that is foolishness to the natural man. Now, why is that? What explains the contrast, the great difference between those two pictures? Why? Because God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things that are mighty. God has chosen the base things of this world, the things which are despised God has chosen, things which are not in order to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no flesh should glory in His presence. So as we've studied the context of this letter to the church at Corinth then, What do we find the false teachers doing? Well, we find them boasting like old Paul. (laughs) They're boasting in the flesh. They are glorying 
in his presence, not unlike the old Paul would have done. The contrast in our text between Paul and these false teachers, between the Apostle Paul and these so-called apostles, is stunning. Both Paul and the false teachers claim to be servants of Christ. Both claim to be preaching the truth. Both claim to be true apostles. But these claims are rooted in two very different and contrasting contexts. The false teachers base their claim on the outward manifestations of strength and wisdom, on the outward manifestations of eloquent speech, on the outward manifestations of their own skill and eloquence, their own worldly wisdom. And what does Paul do? Paul bases his claim on his own weakness. It's this weakness, the weakness of Paul, that the false teachers attempt to exploit. They want to attack Paul on the basis of his weakness. They want to embarrass Paul. They aim to discredit Paul as weak and frail. They want to discredit Paul as persecuted and powerless. The problem that Paul is facing in Corinth is that their attacks are working. Their attacks, their assaults on the Apostle Paul are having an influence on the Corinthians. The Corinthians are taking it in. They're believing the lie. The false teachers have been wildly successful at their efforts. Many have been led astray. They're painting the picture in Corinth that the right personality type, the right charisma, the right worldly confidence, the right hairdo, the right slick suit, the right fancy car, right knowing all the right people, being liked by all the right people, being spoken well of by all the right people, speaking at all the right conferences, having all the right friends, having a large church, not a small church, big numbers, big numbers out to hear them speak, Preaching in just the right way. Looking good while you're preaching. Not spitting. (laughs) Certainly not any of that pounding of the pulpit stuff. That all of that, that all of that is the power of God to salvation for those who believe. The grass is always greener under the leadership of some other guy. Some other man. Some other leader. But Paul knows in Corinth. Stakes are high. Paul knows that he cannot allow his weakness, as weak as he is, to be slandered and misunderstood that way. He can't allow his own weakness to undermine his message, undermine the word of God to these dear Corinthians. For the sake of the Corinthians, he can't ignore the attempts of his opponents to discredit him in this way. So what does Paul do then? What is he forced to do then? What is he compelled to do? He's compelled to boast. He's compelled to embark on a fool's errand. And he descends into the mud with his attackers and boasts of himself. He feels forced to do it. He's reluctant, right? His humility is grieved by having to do this. But in chapter 12, verse 11, the Corinthians have compelled him And how have they compelled him to boast in this way? They've compelled him by giving an ear to his opponents. They've compelled him by believing the lies of these false teachers. And so, by his own admission, Paul here speaks like a madman. He speaks like a fool. He makes himself even more a fool for Christ to win the foolish Corinthians. And so Paul begins his boast. There's a method to Paul's madness here. There's a reason that he boasts in the way that he does. Right? Through this foolish boasting, Paul hopes to accomplish a few ends. Through this foolish boasting, one, Paul intends to discredit those who would try to use his weakness against him. He's going to denounce the false teachers through his own boasting. It may not look like it to the world, but his apostolic credentials are superior to theirs. And Paul is going to denounce these false teachers. Secondly, through his foolish boasting, he wants the Corinthians to accept his weakness as a true and valid expression of his apostleship. He wants them to see this weakness as what it means to be a servant 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not out of the ordinary for someone who follows Christ. In fact, it's a necessary qualification for someone who is a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an essential qualification of his apostleship. Far from disqualifying Paul as an apostle, Paul's suffering is consistent, even expected in gospel ministry. And through this foolish boasting, third, he is going to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in his weakness. Paul's weakness points to the power of God. And in all of this, he's going to encourage us. Right? We're following Paul's example. We're commanded to imitate Paul as he imitates Christ. Then Paul's example here should strengthen us and encourage us to set out in our own service for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll see all this as we work through Paul's boasting, what has been called the fool's speech in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 22 to 33. As we break down the speech, beginning in verse 22... I want us to see Paul's boasting along three distinct lines, or in three distinct categories. Paul boasts regarding his identity. Paul boasts regarding his ministry. And then Paul boasts regarding his infirmity. His identity is ministry and his infirmity. We'll see that laid out clearly in the text. So now, the false teachers in Corinth have been bold, confident to this point in their boasting. They've made their case. They've presented their case to the people. They've laid it out. Sadly, many have been persuaded. But now it's Paul's turn. So Paul then introduces his speech in chapter 11, verse 21, where Paul says, In whatever anyone else is bold, I speak as a fool, I am bold also. They want to lay out their credentials? Fine. Give me a chance to lay out mine, and then we'll compare resumes, so to speak, right? And so the speech begins. Notice first, Paul boasting in his identity in verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I, Paul says. Now in verse 22, as we begin working through the text, we can surmise from the context of verse 22 and others, other texts in the correspondence with Corinth, that identity or Jewish heritage was something the false teachers were boasting of. They were boasting in their Jewishness, right? Notice the plural in verse 22, they. Are they Hebrews? Are they Israelites? In other words, there's more than one of them. There's a contingent in Corinth that have infiltrated the church. There's multiple of them, and Paul now is addressing the group. These are a group of opponents, a group of so-called apostles. Paul calls them false apostles, ministers of Satan. In prior sermons, we identified them as Judaizers. They're boasting in their Hebrew heritage. They're boasting in their Jewishness, so to speak. These are the Jew Judaizers. Jewish professing Christians who were attempting to pervert the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ by adding works of the law, namely circumcision, to faith for salvation. In other words, salvation is not by grace alone, through faith alone, in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Salvation is by faith plus works of the law, namely circumcision. They wanted to compel the Gentiles to live as Jews and be circumcised. They boasted then in their Jewishness. They boasted in being Jewish. Now, Jewishness, quote-unquote, is expressed in three ways in verse 22. They were Hebrews, they were Israelites, and they were descendants of Abraham. Now, it's nuanced here, but each of the three descriptions communicate a different emphasis. The word Hebrew, someone who was Hebrew, was certainly Jewish. But the term Hebrew was used to distinguish between a Hebrew-speaking Jew and a Hellenist, or a Greek-speaking Jew of the diaspora. Jews that were scattered across the Greek world at that time and spoke the Greek language, grew up in a Greek culture, and those Hellenists, or Greek-speaking Jews now, distinguished from Hebrew-speaking Judean Jews, those who grew up in a Hebrew cultural context. In other words, they were accusing the Apostle Paul of being culturally polluted or culturally corrupted. They were accusing Paul because he grew up in Tarsus, which was in Syria, Cilicia, that he was culturally compromised. Now, Paul says, no. In verse 22, are they Hebrews? Hebrews. 
so am I. In fact, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews, raised in Jerusalem, although born in Tarsus, raised in Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel. Now next, Paul describes himself as an Israelite. The Jews, more than 600 times in the Old Testament, are referred to as the children of Israel. The children of Israel. That description, the children of Israel, has to do with their ethnic identity as God's chosen people. Their theocratic identity. Their identity as a nation. They came from Jacob. They were descended from the 12 tribes. They were children of Israel. They are descendants of the patriarch. They can trace their lineage through the 12 tribes to Jacob. To Israel. Now, Paul would say in Romans chapter 9 that it was the Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. In other words, to be an Israelite was an honor. To be an Israelite was a blessing. And they boasted in their Israelite heritage. Now, lastly, they were Hebrews, they were Israelites. Lastly, they were the seed or the offspring of Abraham. Paul says, are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. The Jew would say, we have Abraham as our father, right? In other words, we are heirs of the covenant promises made with Abraham. We are the ones who will inherit land, seed, and blessing. Galatians chapter 3 verse 16 says that now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. So Paul then asks, they're boasting in their Jewishness. Are they Hebrews? Are they Israelites? Are they the seed of Abraham? And he answers the question, so am I. If they are, I am as much so. Now this doesn't undermine Paul's effort elsewhere to explain the covenant distinctions between Jew and Gentile and the fact that they are gone in the Lord Jesus Christ. This isn't a contradiction of that. It doesn't change the fact that true sons of Abraham are those who are of the faith of Abraham. But those biblical truths don't erase the distinctions, do they? Just because Paul says there is neither male nor female doesn't erase the distinction between males and females. It means that we are all inheritors of the promises of God in Christ. Equally inheritors of the promise. Here, those distinctions, those ethnic distinctions aren't gone. And so Paul wants to draw A distinction between the boast of these false apostles and his boast. And he does so by comparing their Jewishness. They were attempting to discredit him in this way. Paul says you can't do it. Paul says they cannot distinguish distinguish themselves from me in that regard. In that regard, they have no advantage over the apostle Paul. Paul says I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. I am an Israelite indeed. False, False apostles were boasting in their identity. And so, then, in answering a fool according to his folly, Paul boasts in his identity. Now, note secondly secondly with me. Not only does he boast in his identity, Paul boasts in his ministry, as they did. He boasts in his ministry. Verse 23. Are they ministers, or are they servants of Christ? Listen, I speak as a fool. I am more a servant of Christ. They claim to be ministers of Christ. Paul says, literally the word means I'm out of my mind. I'm beside myself. I'm out of my mind. I'm speaking as a madman. I am more. I can't believe I'm actually reduced to making this argument. But I am more of a minister of Christ than they are. And what does he say? What does he say to give evidence of this? They claim to be ministers of Christ. Paul is saying, I'm more of a minister of Christ. And then what evidence does he give? Look how many people I've baptized. Right? Look how many people have been saved under my preaching. I preached a revival. We had 300 people walk the aisle and give their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Never mind that 90% of them were under the age of 8. Right? Look how big our church is. Look how many people we've got. Right? Is that what Paul boasted? Church went from 300 to 3,000 since I've been here. Never mind that 2,647 of them are never here. Paul says, I know how to talk in just the right way. I can convince people. Right? I'm so persuasive. Look at how persuasive I am. This ministry that's been blossoming under my leadership, right? Paul boasts in that way? No. I've got all the right stories. I know just how to preach the gospel so it doesn't cause offense. Is that what Paul is boasting in? No. 
Paul says, I am more a minister of Christ than they are. And what is the evidence of that, Paul? Listen, let me tell you how hard it's been. Let me tell you of how difficult it has been. Let me draw your attention to what I've endured for the sake of the gospel. Verse 23. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Amazing, isn't it? Notice in this first group, Paul boasts of his own ministry's opposition. This boasting of Paul, this fool speech can be categorized. Four different categories for the boasting here that Paul does. He begins with opposition. His ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ at the outset has been opposed. Did the false teachers boast like this? No way, not even close. Nothing like this. This is entirely different. It's like Paul saying that his suffering is actually evidence of his authenticity as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's actually evidence that he's a true apostle. It's apparent from reading the letters to Corinth that the false teachers were teaching an over-realized eschatology. They were teaching in Corinth that the time for suffering is over. Look at 1 Corinthians. Flip back a few pages. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And the Corinthians were believing them that the time for suffering is over. You would think by looking at much of professing Christianity today, that they would agree with that statement, that the time for suffering is over. We've got it easy now, right? No, Paul says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, look beginning at verse 8, where Paul says, you're already full. You're already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. Now, this is these are the lies being peddled by the false teachers, and these are the lies that are being taken in by the Corinthians, right? They believe themselves to be full. They believe themselves to be already rich. You've already reigned as kings without us, Paul says. And I, indeed, I could wish you did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles. Now, he's contrasting the way that they are portrayed with the way the Corinthians are viewing themselves. Or the way that the false teachers are presenting themselves. Paul says, I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as the men condemned to death. We've been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. But you are wise in Christ. We are weak. You are strong in Christ. You are distinguished. We are dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst. We are poorly clothed. We are beaten, we're homeless, we labor working with our own hands, being reviled we bless, being persecuted we endure, being defamed we entreat. We've been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things until now. Then notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul's not only drawing a distinction between himself and the false teachers, Paul is distinguishing his own ministry experience with what the Corinthians themselves believe theirs to be. Not just a a distinction or a contrast with the false teachers. This is a distinction or a contrast with many in Corinth. Paul's saying that's not how it is. The Corinthians were under the influence of these false teachers. Paul now contrasts his own experience with theirs as well. Listen, if you believe that the Christian life is going to be a life of ease, If you somehow think that we can rest in our leisure, that we can, active verb, take our ease. If you believe that you can live and even reign like you're already in the kingdom, like there is no war to be fought, like there is no battle that is raging, Like there is no gospel to be preached? Like we don't live in enemy territory with a God-hating world at our door? 
If you can live like that, if you believe that you can live like that, listen, Paul says, you have got it wrong. I wish that you did reign, because we'd all be reigning with you, Paul says. But listen, that's not how it is. That is not how it is. What happens? What happens when you seek to avoid opposition? What happens when you take your ease? What happens when you retreat from that cause? When you retreat from preaching the gospel to a world that hates it? What happens? Well, you get what you want. You get what you want. You don't get opposed. When you refrain from preaching the gospel, you don't get persecuted. You get what you want. When you don't confront this wicked world and its wickedness, then you don't face opposition. Listen, the Lord Jesus Christ said, the world hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. Well, what happens when you stop preaching the law, preaching the gospel, when you stop confronting the world and its wickedness, well, the world starts stops hating you. And what does the world then begin to do? The world begins to love you. Why? Because the world loves its own. But Paul, rather than that, right? Paul, after contrasting his own experience with the experience of the Corinthians themselves, he says, listen, I urge you, imitate me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, look at that text again. Paul, at the end of that, he says in verse 14, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. I warn you, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. Well, how were they to imitate Paul? They were to do what Paul was doing. And what Paul was doing was drawing opposition. What Paul was doing was drawing the antagonism, the hostility of these false teachers. Paul was drawing the hostility of this world. And Paul was suffering under it. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it's that very suffering that validates Paul as a servant, a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you might say, say, listen, Paul, if you want me to imitate you, listen, you're not selling this well. <laughs> this doesn't sound good. And really, at the end of the day, who in the world is going to buy what Paul is selling here? Who's going to buy that? I'll tell you who. The one who understands the gospel. The one who knows what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for them. The one who knows, who understands the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, the shedding of his own blood for them. That one. It's that one. Paul goes on in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. He goes on, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. It's interesting here in verse 23 that Paul mentions his labor in a description of his suffering. Not just hard work, suffering, toil. Not your typical nine to five, Paul would say. The word speaks of an intensity of effort. It means wearisome toil. Paul says further, I've been beaten so many times I can't count them. Listen, I remember every single time in my life that I've ever been struck. <laughs> I mean, that's a memorable experience, isn't it? If <laughs> you get struck. Paul's saying, I've been beaten so many times I can't count them all. Scripture doesn't even record all the times that Paul found himself on the inside of a jail. Paul constantly faced death. He would say in chapter 4, verse 11, right? Always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. And he labored to exhaustion in all of that despite the opposition that he faced. Despite the prisons, despite the stripes, despite the fear of the 
encroachment of death upon him, Paul labored more abundantly than any of them. In fact, he saw all of that as evidence that God was at work through him. That God was blessing his ministry. Verse 24. From the Jews, his own people, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Paul was opposed. Opposed by his own people here, the Jews. This particular punishment described by the Mosaic Law. Listen to this from Deuteronomy chapter 25. Where the law says, if there is a dispute between men and they come to court that the judges may judge them and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, then it shall be if the wicked man deserves to be beaten, that the judge will cause him to lie down and be beaten in his presence according to his guilt with a certain number of blows. Forty blows he may give him and no more lest he should exceed this and beat him with many blows above these, and your brother be humiliated. The word there for humiliate, humiliated means to become contemptible. In other words, the punishment above 40 blows would be seen to be a show of contempt rather than a justifiable punishment, right? It's not just to punish him. Now you want to humiliate him. Now you want to show contempt on him. That was unjust. So the law said, no more than 40, blue, 40 blows. And so what do the legalistic Pharisees do? They took this law and they added their own and they say, no more than 39. Right? 40 minus 1, just in case we miscount, we don't want to go over 40. So the law of the Jews was 40 stripes minus 1. Paul received from the Jews five times, five times, 40 scourgings, 40 stripes Minus one. Three times, verse 25, I was beaten with rods. That's the Roman equivalent of the Jewish punishment. The Romans would beat you with rods. And they wouldn't count often. One of those beatings is described in Acts chapter 16. This was such that Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, no hyperbole here, that I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. The scars of the Lord Jesus. We can only imagine what Paul's back looked like. Right? What Paul endured. He says, once I was stoned. You can read about that in Acts 14. Paul would be shipwrecked. And Paul would still be shipwrecked yet again on his way to Rome in Acts 27. It would be there that Paul would eventually lose his head. And Paul says, imitate me. Imitate me. These are the credentials of my ministry. I have been opposed. Well, if you're going to imitate Paul, listen, brother, sister. If you're going to imitate Paul, you are going to face opposition. You are going to be opposed. You are going to face opposition too. Now, if you're going to face opposition also, and you're going to step out in service to the Lord Jesus Christ, faithful and steadfast in the face of opposition, then you're going to need, as Paul has, a right understanding of the place of suffering and the place of opposition in the Christian life. If you don't understand that, then you're not going to face opposition as Paul did. You're not going to remain steadfast. You're not going to remain faithful. You're going to shrink back. Why is it that Paul doesn't shrink back? Because Paul has a cross-informed understanding of his own suffering. He has a Jesus Christ-fueled understanding of his own opposition, of his own trials. He understands what the Christian life is. You're going to need a proper understanding of how your weakness then is to display the power of God in the gospel. You're going to need a biblical cross informed, Christ-fueled understanding of how your opposition, your suffering, your trials magnify the glory of Christ. Paul's ministry glorifies the Lord. And Paul is saying, this is how it does it, right? This is how we magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. I magnify the Lord Jesus Christ in my weakness. And if we're going to imitate Paul, 
we're going to face opposition. There's a sense in which, right, you read the New Testament and you, you, you hear Paul describing his suffering. Here, boasting in his weakness. There's a sense at which Paul is leaning into it, right? He understands it. Elsewhere, Paul says he is, these are the afflictions of Christ. He's filling up in his own service to Christ the afflictions of Christ. He's suffering for his sake. Now, Paul's not merely opposed. Paul's ministry was continuously imperiled. It was continuously endangered. Paul was vulnerable. And next, in the next category, Paul speaks of his vulnerability, the danger that he faced. Look at verse 25. Three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I've been in the deep. Again, Paul would face yet again another shipwreck in Acts 27 on his way to Rome. Verse 26, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils, in other words, in constant hostility from, in constant danger from, Paul says, his own countrymen, the Jews, in danger or in peril of the Gentiles, so not just on the seas, not just from people, but now on the land, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, so not just in public Places in the city now and unpopulated places out in the wilderness, I'm in peril. In perils in the sea, not just on land. In perils among false brethren, even among those who profess to be Christians. If you've been a follower of Christ for any length of time, and you faced opposition, that one stings. Right? Even among those who profess to be the Lord's people. Even among those who profess to be Christians. Paul is imperiled among false brethren. Reminds us, Paul is reminding us, that we are not promised safety or security. We're not promised it. In fact, Paul expected exactly the opposite. He says in Acts chapter 20, verse 23, The Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Paul just expected it. Paul's ministry was opposed. Paul's ministry was vulnerable, imperiled. And Paul's ministry was arduous. It was hard. Verse 27. In weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. In other words, in deprivation and exposure. Paul certainly knew what it meant to be abased. Intense and prolonged hardship. A faithless man would never endure this. Right? Anyone else would not endure this. Anyone would say, listen, it's not worth it. Who are those who would say with Paul that this is worth it? Those who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who have an understanding of what the Lord has secured for them in his own person and work. No one would ever endure this for some worldly, wicked, pointless cause. And even you and I, to my shame... I often complain of being tired. <laughs> In light of this text, <laughs> like, oh man, you know, it's been a long day, it's been a long week, <laughs> whatever it's been. It's not been this long. <laughs> and Paul is boasting in his weariness. You, you work a hard job? Maybe you're a blue collar guy. You come home after a hard day at work. And you say, you know, I'm tired. I'm going to put my feet up. I deserve to rest. Paul is boasting in his weariness. Boasting in the toil with which he worked. Often, you can imagine, all-nighters. In sleeplessness, often, Paul said. Where he's working in ministry, working with people all day. 
and then making tents at night to support his own ministry. So he's not a burden to them while he ministers to them during the day. I want the, the right perspective of these things so that I don't, in my own laziness or in my own complaining, I don't show myself to be despising God's grace, the means of grace, the goodness of God toward me by failing or shrinking back in my service to Him, or availing myself of the preaching of God's Word during the week, or on a Sunday night, or a Sunday morning, or that I shrink back from living for the Lord Jesus Christ and serving Him, walking in a way which is worthy of the calling with which I've been called. I think we should be informed from texts like this to understand rightly what it is we are here to do, right? What it is we are here to be, how we are to serve Him. And I want to cut my tongue out of my mouth when I complained. Paul is opposed his ministry is vulnerable, it seems, frail. If it weren't for the grace and power of God Almighty, it seems it just would be blown away. Right? There's so many dangers that Paul faced. It was arduous. Paul labored, weary, toilsome labor. And lastly, it's weighty. Not only physically weighty, Physically taxing, but emotionally taxing. Paul says in verse 28, besides all these other things, what comes upon me daily is my deep concern for all the churches. And what does that look like, Paul? Verse 29, who is weak? And I'm not weak with them. I'm not agonizing in their weakness with them. I'm not coming alongside. Empathy is what that's called. Sharing their burden. Who is weak and I'm not weak? Who is made to stumble and I don't burn in my heart and soul with a righteous anger over it? With righteous indignation? In other words, when somebody stumbles off into sin, listen, my, I'm here to preach. <laughs> so that person can fend for themselves. Is that Paul's attitude? <laughs> no. Paul is in agony over the churches. He's shedding Tears, blood, and sweat over this church in Corinth. That kind of empathy is motivated by love, right? What false teacher is there in Corinth out there claiming this? What false teacher today do you see exemplifying this? Not a one that I can think of. Not a one that I've seen. Not a one that I've heard. What false teacher can you think of that is living like this? That is enduring like this. Steadfast and faithful like this. This kind of empathy, this kind of labor, this kind of uh, entering into this kind of service is motivated by love. Love for the Lord Jesus Christ and love for the Lord's church. Love for the Lord's people. Right? Love for these people. These false teachers aren't entering into that kind of pain. That kind of suffering. Those kinds of trials for those people. They're not doing it. They're the hirelings. That run when the wolf approaches, right? They're there to exploit them. They're not there to care for them. They're not there out of love for them. They're, out of their, they're there for, out of love for themselves. They're serving themselves in their ministry. Boosting their own reputation. Patting their own wallet. They're there for themselves. So they boast in their identity. Their Jewish heritage. And Paul says they are no more Jewish than I am. They boast in their ministry. They boast that they are servants of Christ. And Paul says, I am more so. Can the false teachers boast like this? Have they given like I have? 
Do they love you like I love you? You know, ultimately, it's not the sacrifice of Paul that's being magnified. What sacrifice in Paul is being magnified? It's the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul is going to get there. Do they or have they sacrificed for you as the Lord Jesus Christ has sacrificed for you? No way. Not even close. Do they love you like you've been loved in Christ? Do they really love the Lord Jesus Christ? Have they really been faithful? Admittedly here, Paul is speaking like a fool. But listen, even though he speaks like a fool, even though he's speaking like a madman here, isn't this obvious, church? Right? Can't we just think for a moment and say, yeah, this is right. Even though he's boasting in this folly of boasting, Paul is saying, don't you see it? (laughs) Don't you see it? Don't you see the difference? But lastly, if Paul is going to be compelled to boast, he simply is not going to boast as they have. He says in verse 30, If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity, my weakness. I will boast to cut off the opportunity of these false teachers to boast in themselves. I will boast, if I must, out of love for you, Corinthians. I will boast to preserve the authenticity of the Lord's bond slaves. But if I must boast, I will only boast in my weakness. Not as these fools boast, but as a true servant of the Lord Jesus Christ boasts. Boasting in what it means to serve the Lord Christ. And then Paul gives an example. He gives an example in verse 31. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. He swears an oath here. Right? That's oath language. It's an oath regarding what he's already said. Listen, this is true. Start to finish. This is the way that it is. And the Lord himself knows that I'm not lying. Right? He swears an oath here regarding what he's already said. But now he's going to confirm all of that with an example. In Damascus, verse 32, the governor under Aretas the king, was guarding the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. You might think at first blush, this is an afterthought. This example just sort of comes to Paul's mind. No, this example brilliantly serves Paul's purpose. It's not coincidental, think with me now, It's not coincidental that Paul mentions this story from where? From Damascus. Paul was a strong, proud, arrogant, self-seeking, self-serving Pharisee. An insolent man. A proud man. And Paul was crushed on the road to Damascus. Paul was made weak. Paul was already weak. Paul was made to see his frailty. Paul was made to suffer, you could say, the indignity of his own weakness before God. He was humbled. After Damascus, Paul cannot boast in his own strength. How could he? Paul sees himself, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, as nothing. As nothing. How could he, after Damascus, how could he boast in his own strength, in his own power? How could Paul boast in his own wisdom? He has no claim whatsoever to boast that he is the source of his own preservation. That he's gotten himself to where he is to this day. Right? That he's preserved himself. He has no claim to boast of that. And all that's because, all that is because he has no claim on God's forgiveness, God's love, God's mercy, no claim on God's preservation, God's strength, God's power, no claim on that, but a claim of God's own mercy and grace and love in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is the one who arrested him on the road to Damascus. It is by the grace of God alone that he was preserved from death in Damascus. And it is to the glory of God alone that Paul has been preserved in his service to the Lord to this very day. Through all the trials, all the tribulations that Paul has faced, beginning with this one, 
The Lord has preserved him through it all. Not crediting any of that to Paul himself. It is all by the grace of God. He traces it all back to that Damascus Road encounter with the risen Lord. And Paul carries that with him. Can you see? We are two decades later. Paul is carrying all of that with him daily as he serves the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, for Paul, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which Paul is saved, his death to sin, his death to self, all of that is not limited to a past event only. Paul carries that with him into his present circumstances. Paul carries that with him. The dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, he carries with him daily as he serves the Lord. Daily. As Paul denies himself, takes up his own cross, and follows the Lord. Paul is daily communicating his own understanding of what Christ has done for him. Daily in the way that he lives his life. Listen, brother. Listen, sister. You don't live merely, merely or only in light of a past event. That event, that grace of God in which you now stand should fuel and drive and motivate your Christian service now. Your love for the Lord, your service of the Lord, your service of the Lord's church. His own understanding of Christ's sacrifice to save sinners, of whom he is chief, now drives Paul, now compels Paul to remain steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And Paul, now, seeing the Lord work in that way, Paul has great confidence that God is now manifesting the work and sacrifice of his son in and through his life and ministry. That should give us confidence. When you face opposition, when you face trials, when you face difficulty, when in the face of those trials, that difficulty, you have your faith rooted and grounded in the Lord Jesus Christ, such that by faith you face that which comes, you magnify the grace of God in Christ. It's how your weakness, listen, apart from Him you can do nothing. It's how your weakness magnifies the power of God in the gospel. The power of God in Christ. When it comes to boasting then, Paul's weakness is identified or identifiable with Christ's weakness. He describes his suffering as the afflictions of Christ. This kind of ministry is the only valid expression of the crucified Messiah and his gospel. When the people of God face trials, face hardship, face difficulty, face opposition for the cause of Christ, and they endure in faith. And if you face that in faith, if you have that understanding, right, as Paul does here, if you live in light of that, steadfast, faithful, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, by faith, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, right? But Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live for Him. The one who died for me. The one who gave Himself for me. The one who loved me. The one who's forgiven me of my sins. Paul's understanding then, living in that way, he lives in light of the promise of that, that one day... He himself will fully participate in resurrection glory and resurrection power and resurrection incorruptibility. Right? Because Paul says, if he has died, then we have all died in him. And if he has been raised, then we will be raised in the likeness of his resurrection. If we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, 
that our old man was crucified with him. Amen? So we live then in resurrection power. We live then in light of resurrection promises and resurrection glory. Why? Because we've died in Him. And Paul dies daily. And brother and sister, listen, if we're going to be faithful to the Lord, we die daily. You die to sin and self daily. You die to the pleasures and the trappings of this wicked world. You die to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. You die to self. You take up your cross daily and you follow Him. Why? Because we've died with Him. And if we've died with Him, we'll also be raised with Him. And we live in light of the promised hope of a glorious resurrection with Him. When you consider Paul's example in ministry here, when you consider his boasting, foolish as he says that is, we can see, can't we, that his boasting here, not only necessary to deal with the opponents in Corinth, their slanderous attacks, but this weakness, Paul's weakness, understood in the light of the cross of Christ, understood in the context of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ, should be a great source of strength, a great source of encouragement, a great source of hope, a great source of joy, a great source of comfort to the Christian. Just as the gospel conceals itself in weakness, so also the weakness of Paul, far from disqualifying him for apostolic ministry, is the stage on which is displayed the glory of Christ. It's only by the power of God that he could accomplish his mission, overcome his weakness, and persevere. This weak and fragile clay pot this earthen vessel has become a vessel for the display of the divine power, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians says as much. Listen to this from chapter 4, verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that, that the excellent... What is an earthen vessel? It's weak. It's frail. We have this treasure, the gospel, in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Do you see how even in Paul's boasting, the excellence of the power doesn't rest in him? Even in his boasting, what he's boasting in the Lord, glorying in the Lord. We are hard pressed on every side, yet we are not crushed. We are perplexed, we are not in despair, persecuted, not forsaken, struck down, not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. It needs to be a present, ongoing reality for the Christian, right? That I deny myself, take up my cross once a week. No. Right? There are many who do not deny themselves and taking up their cross looks like once a week when they have to fight traffic to get to church on Sunday morning for an hour. That's, that's disconnected entirely from the example of Paul and what is being described here. Th those things are alienated from one another entirely. Paul says, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. That's what Paul is doing in his ministry. When Paul perseveres, he remains steadfast and faithful, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Paul is manifesting the life of Jesus in his body. Manifesting the life of giving power of God in His ministry. For we who live 
are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also be, may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then, death is working in us, but life in you. We've got to understand, too, and balance this by saying that Paul isn't glamorizing weakness here. He's not praising weakness. Listen, weakness merits nothing. Just like strength merits nothing. Worldly wisdom merits, no, it merits less than nothing. <laughs> it merits wrath. But weakness doesn't merit praise. Weakness is not a meritorious thing, right? Paul's not praising weakness. Paul knows that his life and ministry is a living demonstration that the gospel alone is the power of God to salvation. All glory then must be rendered to the Lord Christ alone. Those things that people in this world consider to be mighty have been disgraced and shown to be nothing by God's choice of those things that are considered by this world to be weak. In order to show that it is God who is the one who makes strong. It is God who is the one who saves the sinner. That accomplishes his work of salvation to his own glory. The question is then. How well do you apprehend, comprehend this reality? How well do you grasp it? How well do we consider these things? How well do we understand it? If we understand it, if we comprehend it, if we apprehend it, then won't that, think with me, won't that have a dramatic impact on the way that you live your life and serve in the Lord's church? It is bound to. To the degree that I don't understand these things, to the degree that I don't apprehend them, is to the degree that I will retreat to my own comforts, retreat to my own flesh, retreat to boasting the way these fools in Corinth are boasting. Is to the degree that I will become self-reliant, is to the degree that I will fear men and fear opposition, and fear loss, fear danger, fear lack of security. Is to the degree that I'll become a coward. Is to the degree that I will shrink back. Is to the degree that I will be faithless and truly weak. If that's you, or as we consider, you and I, as we consider our own inherent weakness, don't you, don't I, right, wouldn't you agree with me that we, what we need, more than anything, is a spirit-empowered, spirit-enabled enlightenment, an understanding of these truths that so grips our heart that we will die to self daily. That's what we need. These are glorious truths. The Lord Jesus Christ is worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. What prevents me from living a life of cross-empowered Cross informed service to him, imitating the example of Paul here. What prevents me? What hinders me? My own flesh, my own ignorance, my own sin, my own lack of ability to see these things from the perspective of truth. Will you 
pursue an understanding of these things in God's word? Will you accept this reality? Will you live in light of it? Will you step out in faithfulness to preach the gospel to lost people? Facing the opposition, facing the scorn, facing the derision. Listen, if you're here, you've never turned from your sin. Will you turn from the empty and vacuous and vain trappings of this wicked world and turn to Him who has died to give you life? Will you die in your sin? Has your proud, Pharisaic heart truly been humbled? Are you willing to be a fool for the Lord Jesus Christ? We can't forget what he has done, right? There are those who have forgotten their first love. We can't forget our first love. We can't forget the sacrifice. We can't live in ignorance of it. We need a fresh grasp of that mercy and grace every single day, don't we? Faithfulness will incur opposition. Lean into it. Go outside the camp. This is humbling, isn't it? Paul abandons himself to the cause, steadfast and faithful through difficulty. This is the fruit of spirit-given understanding, true wisdom, so that the power of Christ might be shown in him. And what a joy to know The power of Christ is shown in you and I when we face our weakness in faith as he does. That his grace, his power, his strength might be magnified. All praise, honor, and glory to the one who suffered and bled and died for us. Let's pray. Consider your own heart before the Lord now, your own comprehension, apprehension of these things. Let's plead together for God by His Spirit to humble us and to fuel our faithfulness to Him. When you're done praying, you are dismissed. 